Hi, welcome to The Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. I think I can say, with all honesty, that in all of my years of teaching weavers to cut their cloth and turn it into fantastic clothing, the most daunting part of the process is not designing and weaving the cloth, washing that cloth, getting the pattern to fit, or using rusty skills to make a great garment, the most daunting part of making a handwoven garment is cutting the cloth. There is this fear that once you've made a cut, that the fabric will just disintegrate and you'll have nothing left to work with. Rest assured, that is not the case. First, let's talk about handwoven fabric. Fabric woven for the purposes of making garments, should be firmly set and properly washed. There are or will be other videos on these particular topics, but we will start this video with cloth that has been set properly and washed. That's important. If you've gotten that part right, you're mostly there. So for example, this piece of leftover handwoven fabric, um, if we look at this cut edge, this has a wool content in some areas and a wool weft. And so if you look and you kind of just play with the edge, you'll see that raveliness is minimal. I would probably just start sewing this garment um, once it's been cut out. I wouldn't do anything special to treat the edges. On the other hand, this fabric, left over from another project, has all sorts of raveliness. There's, this is all rayon, and rayon just has a mind of its own. It's slippery. It's a slippery yarn. So this fabric, I might do something to help stabilize the edges. This fabric, left over from a piece that I've done, uh, was has a merino and silk weft and was very fulled. It's a meaty fabric and yet it has a nice hand for the, uh, for the actual coat that was made from it. And you can see that there is some ravel, but it's really minimal. I mean, this really doesn't disintegrate from basic handling. Now, this fabric, which was all rayons and cottons, and this actually made the dress on the dress form behind me, this fabric did have a very ravelly component. And if you look, this does, this does actually come apart. I would probably um, handle this minimally and just get to it. But this is an area where you could absolutely stabilize this edge so excessive raveling doesn't happen. And the yarns that wove this are fairly meaty, meaning that there's not a lot of ends in a seam allowance of fabric of this type. So if I were to even lose a couple of threads, I would lose a substantial amount of my seam allowance. This fabric has, again, a wool component in the weft and was nicely fulled, so it's very stable. And if you look, the raveling here isn't, isn't terrible. Um, or at least I don't consider that terrible. And this fabric, which is all hand dyed yarns, um, almost all, they're all cellulose. There is a little bit of silk in here, but these are all hand dyed cellulose yarns like cottons and rayons. And maybe in the cotton area, it's not so ravelly, but in the rayon areas and the areas where there is a twill structure, this tends to ravel badly. So structure does come into play here along with uh, fiber content. 
but a, a, a fabric like this, I would, after cutting out my garment, probably stabilize the edges. And we're going to get to that. Now this fabric, which I just actually pulled from the loom and made a vest from, this has a very fat cotton bamboo component, which is set in a way that it travels over and under a pair of wefts. And in between that are these very, very fine ground threads, which are metallics and this very fine slippery rayon. Because, again, the size of the warp, you may say that if I were to lose a couple of these threads, I would lose a substantial amount of my seam allowance. So this might be an area where I would also stabilize the edge. And finally, I have this fabric here that's uh, the leftover scrap from the coat that you see on the form behind me. And you can see here, this is a warp and weft, all wool content. And it has been fulled a bit. It's not felted. You can still clearly see the patterning and the structure. But the fraying on this is really minimal. This is not a fabric that's going to disintegrate as soon as you cut it out and go to the sewing machine. I would say that probably 60% of the time, when I cut into a hand-woven fabric, I do nothing to the edges, and I move right into sewing the garment, really. In my particular patterns, the directions, which you can always get for free on my website, that link will be below, the, those directions are clearly written assuming you're working with handwoven fabric. So they may give you options about what to do. There are times though when for many reasons a fabric is particularly ravelly. And we talked about some of those, a, a fat warp yarn or um, a rayon component or a twill structure that's you know pretty loosely set. And for those times, I have a few hints. Before I get to those hints though, I have to talk about grain line. This is a hugely critical subject that I can't talk about enough. This is the leftover yardage from the top that I'm wearing. And I want to explain first about grain lines and terminology. This piece of handwoven cloth has a selvage, obviously, on both sides. When we refer to lengthwise grain in sewing, what we really mean is that the lengthwise grain is synonymous with a warp thread. And so here, if you look, the lengthwise grain of this is actually parallel to a warp thread and is pretty stable. There's some give here because of the structure and because of the loftiness of the yarns, but this is very stable on the lengthwise grain. And likewise, the weft, which would span from selvage to selvage, also has a stability. And in sewing, we call that the crosswise grain. And again, because of the size of the yarns and the puffiness of the structure, there's going to be a little give in that direction. But for the most part, the crosswise or weft direction and the lengthwise or warp direction are stable. Any cut to a length of fabric that is parallel to a warp or a weft is considered on grain. The same for any line of stitching. Now, where we get into an interesting situation is the 45 degree bisection of that right angle of warp and weft. The 45 degree bisection of that is called the true bias. And anyone who sews regularly knows that the true bias can either be your best friend or your worst enemy. There is significant give and stretch on the bias 
which is why when you use the bias as a grain line, you can get some pretty cool effects like this bias top, which just molds and drapes over body parts because there's so much give to it. So any cut or stitching line that is not parallel to a warp or weft is considered off grain. So there will be considerable give to this cut line or seam line, and that needs to be addressed. One of the first options for stabilizing ravelly edges is to just stitch right along the edge as close as you can get with a straight stitch. But, and this is really important, in the direction of the grain. So using this hand-woven front, which has already begun to be assembled, I have Hong Kong seam finishes on the shoulder, and on the side seam, the pockets are in place, okay? I can show you what happens when you stitch with the grain and when you stitch against it. So this neckline is clearly cut off grain. Let me line it up with the board so you can see using a grid that This edge is not following a warp thread, and this edge is not following a weft thread. This is a problem. So the rule of thumb here is to always stitch from the widest part to the narrowest part, and from the highest part to the lowest part. So let me demonstrate that. I'm going to use my finger as a, a presser foot. I would be applying pressure. And when I'm stitching from the wider part, and you can do that by looking at the grid of the board, this is wider than this. So I'm using my finger as a presser foot, and I'm going along applying pressure, and I'm stitching along that very edge. And when I get to the top, it is very unremarkable and there is nothing distorted about this edge. That would be the direction you need to sew in. But if you were to grab this pattern piece after cutting it out and go to the sewing machine and just start stitching all the way around it, regardless of grain, what happens is, and here's that same presser, foot pressure, okay, what happens is you end up stitching additional length into that whole section of your front. Now I've had a lot of people ask me why is that and my lovely daughter would look at me and say mother it's a physics thing. What's actually happening here when you stitch with the grain is that you're dropping off warp threads. They just pass freely underneath the presser foot and fall away. So there really isn't any distortion. But when you stitch against the grain, what, you're, what happens with the presser foot, which is applying pressure, is that it's actually trying to pick up these warp threads, and they don't go easily under the presser foot. They end up splaying, which is what causes the lengthening of that cut edge. The same principle would be held. Um, I stitched along the edge before I put the Hong Kong seam finish on. And I started from the high point, as is referenced to the weft, and ended at the low point. Again, dropping off weft threads as I went along. Here's another front. Um, this is actually from my 400 jacket. It is um, a jacket front, again, with that curved neckline. And this has a bust start, and it has a waist start, and it has uh, placement lines for a welt pocket. You notice all of the red tails. Those are from Taylor's Tacks. I used to transfer the marks to this before I removed the pattern. There is a video on that 
whole technique of transferring the marks to your fabric um, and the link for that will be in the description below. Now let's look at this. Um, this is a particularly ravel, ravelly fabric. I, it is not hand woven, um, but it's actually uh, more difficult to work with than my regular hand wovens. So this is a Chanel type tweed. Um, it has some fat warps and it has some very fine warps and it has some loose wefts and it is very, very um, skewy and ravelly. I know those aren't real words, but we can make them up. Now, I started here because although this edge is on grain, it, and I could have stitched in any direction, I eventually needed to go in this direction here. So I started down here and just worked my way along the very, very edge as best my machine could handle. And I moved along here on this edge until I got to the top. So there's really no distortion on this. So the shoulder line is clearly off grain because our shoulders are sloped. The high point is here and the low point is here. So if I'm stitching highest to lowest in relationship to the weft, then I would start here and stitch right along the edge to support that cut edge. Down here, the side seam at the hip is usually wider than the underarm, so it would make sense to start here to stitch right along that edge, and then here, because again, this is wider and narrower, I'm going to stitch right along this edge, and then we're going to address the armhole. Now, armholes present an interesting grain line dilemma. Uh, and I have a lot of people who ask me, the other area would be a crotch on a pair of pants, ask me, how do I tell the direction? Well, if you put a gridded board underneath and line up the warp threads on the grid, you can see that this edge here this upper edge of the armhole in this particular pattern. And this is very pattern specific. So you have to really look at your pattern in relationship to the grain line markings on it. I would start here and I would be dropping off threads and I would get to about here. Now, this area is a little bit more interesting because right here I'm on the straight of grain. So right here, it doesn't really matter whether I go this way or this right way, but this here, if you look compared to the grid, is actually on the 45. So this is bias. And bias doesn't matter whether you go this way or this way. It's going to respond the same way. It's going to stretch. So the only area that's of real concern is right here. And it depended on my machine and how well it fed fabric, whether I go and then this way and meet here, or whether I just continued all the way out. Your mileage will vary. And it depends on a number of things. But a test would actually tell you whether you can safely go from here this way, or whether you need to go this way and meet it. The serger comes up a lot as an option. Uh, the fear of cutting into hand woven is such that I've heard of people who say, as soon as I cut, I race to the serger and I immediately serge the fabric all around the edges. That's not a great practice for all of the reasons that I just went over with straight stitching. The direction of the grain is pretty critical here. Yes, many sergers have something called a differential feed, which changes the timing of the needle looper mechanism with the feed dogs and how much fabric gets pulled through the, in relationship to the stitching. This helps to minimize stretching um, when the serging must be done against the grain. If you own a serger, take advantage of the differential feed if you have it but I highly recommend that you still stitch with the grain. Don't trim off any of the seam ravels and serge 
on the wrong side or the right side, whichever is appropriate to accommodate the direction of the grain. So here is a piece of fabric that I kept right side up and I clearly have an edge that is off grain and I just started surging and you can see based on my previous demonstrations that this got pretty distorted. Okay, it's a common problem. Now this sample I actually went with the grain, but in order to do that, considering that this is the front face of the fabric, I had to stitch this upside down. So here, the surging is upside down. So the problem is that surging is one-sided. So as in this case, you may have the surging upside down in some parts of the garment section in order to accommodate the direction of the grain. If you intend to have the surged edge become the permanent seam finish, as opposed to say a completely lined garment when, who cares, um, consider it stitching first with a straight stitch in the direction of the grain. And that would be again widest to narrowest, okay, in the direction of the grain, and then surging, in which case this was surged actually right side up because the edge was had been stabilized by the straight stitching. So here you have the surging on the right side where it belongs, and it has been stabilized, that edge has been stabilized by straight stitching, which was done first with the grain. Zigzagging is a popular option. And again, not only is the direction you stitch important, which we've already talked about, but zigzagging can actually compress your seam allowance, rendering it inaccurate. The zig and the zag stitches are under tension, and a seam allowance, especially a hand-woven one, is pretty pliable. So here is an example of zigzagging on a commercial fabric. And you can see that I have zigzagged just this section here. And if you line up the cut edge with this board, you can see that there's clearly some loss of depth of seam allowance. That may not seem like a big deal, but when you add up that loss all the way around a garment, when you have side seams and front and back seams and potentially princess seams, you can actually change the dimensions of the garment by that much. So here is an example of zigzagging on a hand woven garment. Now this is a very loosely constructed, this is an old fabric from my production line in the 80s. It was very loosely set and you can see clearly how much change there is close to a quarter of an inch in that edge where I zigzagged. There is a special presser foot called an overedge foot which has a stitch finger similar to what would be on a serger presser foot and that little stitch finger supports the width of the zigzag to keep it from collapsing the cut edge. You can also use this overedge foot with a number of utility stitches that more modern machines might have to actually simulate a surged or overlocked edge. So here is a utility stitch in my machine and it actually was done with this foot so there's no collapsing of the edge. And here it is with a very loosely constructed and ravelly hand woven. That same utility stitch, it does lock in the edge and this foot prevents an edge collapse. And, and actually, here it is with a standard zigzag. Again, it prevented any distortion in my seam allowance. In severe cases, like this fabric that I just cut out, which I've already previously demonstrated stitching on the edge. Um, but this fabric, uh, 
which is very loosely woven and very, very ravelly. I will actually, um, a much better solution is to actually stabilize all of the cut edges with a fusible interfacing. I do this step while the pattern is still attached to the fabric. It is pinned all the way around and I've set the pins just inside slightly so I'm not interfering with the edges. I will do this step while the pattern is still attached and it keeps, it helps to keep the garment section from stretching out of shape while the stabilizer is applied. This is an especially good trick for scoop necks, um, scoop neck tops like what I'm wearing. The stabilizer that I use is a product called Fusing It, which I sell in my web shop. Um, the link will be in the description below. Every interfacing manufacturer sells something similar, and it usually comes in black or white. This interfacing is actually a knit construction, and it is stable in the lengthwise grain, but very stretchy in the crosswise grain. It is the stretch that you are looking for. Since this interfacing, cut into one centimeter or three-eighths inch strips, must mold around the curved edges of your garment. So, determine the stretchy direction, which is on the crosswise, perpendicular to the selvage, or the long edge of the knit interfacing. Fold it up so it fits on your board, and it fits... under the ruler. Use a straight edge and rotary cutter to cut one centimeter or three-eighths of an inch wide strips. Once you have a pile, take each pattern section and turn it over so the wrong side shows. And you'll notice that I am still attached to the pattern. So I can make sure there's no distortion while I'm doing this. Fuse a strip to the edge of the garment fabric all the way around the perimeter while it's still attached to the pattern. Just a note, because my real iron that I use in the studio is on the wall behind the camera, I'm actually set up a mock pressing station here. My regular gravity-fed iron does the job flawlessly. And in case you're interested, a link for that iron uh, I will have in the description below. You'll see that the interfacing strip, when cut in the crosswise direction, will mold easily into areas like armholes and curves. It's important to make sure that you have the proper front face of the interfacing up. The sparkly, sandpapery side is the side with the glue. So the smooth side goes up, the sparkly, sandpapery side goes down, and you can see how easy it is to mold this crosswise cut strip along the edge. To fuse, hover with a good steam iron, just hover, to pre-shrink the interfacing. And then, using a press cloth, I like silk organza, press firmly with the steam iron for 15 seconds. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, 1,000, 14, 1,000, 15. 
and there it's firmly attached. So now I can move on and do the rest of that armhole. Now, this piece can be removed from the pattern and it is beautifully stable on the edges. This motorcycle vest was constructed with a surged seam finish. And if you look inside, it's unlined. And in order to keep the surging right side up and to have a very crisp, clean seam finish on the cut edge. I used this technique of fusing a stabilizer strip of interfacing all around the perimeter edge. I did that first before I surged. Here you can see again there was a stabilizer strip fused to the wrong side of each of the edges and the serger then cleaned up that edge and I have a really nice professional looking finish in a vest that is unlined and really not meant to be taken off. Please understand that I don't often have to go through this effort. Mostly if a fabric is stable enough, simply proceeding to the sewing directions is enough. Handling a cut piece of handwoven fabric is what causes the issues. Constantly trying on a garment that has not had the cut edges stabilized in some way is asking for trouble. On the other hand, I've seen students so terrified that the yarn is going to just completely unravel and wind itself back up on the cone that they overconstruct the edges and not taking into account the grain of the fabric and they make a worse mess than if they had just left it alone. Practice is important here. And testing, always testing scraps. Once you cut out a garment, carefully lay it aside and play with those scraps. Play with appropriate seam finishes. There will be more videos on those later on. And see how badly the edges ravel when handled. You may not have an issue at all if there's a wool content, but if the fabric is a loosely set rayon or tencel that slips and slides all over the place, or the warp threads were bulky and meaty, or it was a twill structure that has a, you know, a large over and under float, consider some of the steps outlined in this video. To put a leash on those wild edges and bring some control back to that fabric. I'm Daryl Lancaster for The Weaver Sews.